People believe the fourth industrial revolution is the ultimate threat to humanity. We don't believe in this. We are determined to make the fourth industrial revolution more human. Join me as I take you through Gendermark Automation's journey as we try to transform our business from a third industrial revolution company focused on automation solutions to a fourth industrial revolution co company focused on digital solutions where we try to make the fourth industrial revolution more human. I'd like to start off with a bit of background about Gendermark Automation. So we are a special purpose machine builder that has a focus on the automotive industry. So we design and manufacture turnkey production lines for our customers. We are approximately 650 employees. We have four offices around the world, South Africa, India, Germany, and in the US. Our production lines uh, primarily focus on powertrain assembly systems and catalytic converter assembly systems. And what I wanted to focus on today uh, is more about our digital services division. But before I dive into that, I just want to give you a little bit about powertrain. So for us, powertrain, powertrain is engine, axle, and differential assembly system. So uh, for example, this is a production line we've designed and built for one of our customers in the US. It is actually a differential assembly line. It assembles differentials at approximately 48 seconds. So every 48 seconds, we're producing a differential off that production line. And as you can see from these pictures, there's engine, axle, and even now more recently, electric vehicle assembly systems. The other area of focus, as I mentioned, was catalytic converter assembly systems. Um, and these comprise of various uh, types of systems. Uh, this one on my top left here is a manual assembly process that we've, we've put together where we focus on uh, utilizing the, the labor and people on a production line and in complete contrast to that, you see over here a fully autonomous production line we've done for one of our customers in, in, in Germany where there are absolutely no people on the production line. All the raw material is delivered on conveyors and the finished goods are taken away from uh, on AGVs. So in a nutshell, that's what Gendermark has been focusing on for the last 20 to 25 years. And where we're headed to is really uh, into this new era of the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. But we have a clear focus, and that is to make the fourth industrial revolution more human. It is one of the fundamental values that we have within our digital services division, is to really use technology to unlock human potential. And to better explain our thoughts on the fourth industrial revolution, I want to start off by debunking some of the, the myths around this topic of the fourth industrial revolution. And the first one is that the fourth industrial revolution will make jobs obsolete. And I want to use a South African example uh, to better explain this idea and why we, do, we don't agree with that. And what you can see over here are six organizations that operate in South Africa. And above that are these circles. And the size of the circle represents the number of people they're employing, direct, directly employing within their organization. So I'll give you a minute to, to try and match the organization with the size of the bubble, which represents the, the people that they're employed. I'll give you a second to actually you know, give it a think. Bearing in mind, it's, it's purely a South African view. And here it is. As you can see, some of the biggest organizations in South Africa don't necessarily employ the most people. And what's really interesting for us is that you see a fourth industrial revolution digital business like Uber, actually over the last six to seven years, has actually created 13,000 opportunities in the form of drivers for people in South Africa. So this notion that the fourth industrial revolution is actually going to be taking jobs away, we don't believe in that. In fact, applied correctly, the fourth industrial revolution can actually create jobs for people. And I think people often mix up this idea of automation, which is what some of the big organizations and manufacturing organizations are focusing on, which actually does take people off production lines, versus digitalization, which is what Uber has actually done. They've digitalized the taxi business and actually created 13,000 opportunities just in South Africa alone. So the next myth that I'd like to debunk is this idea that the fourth industrial revolution is going to require more skills. And I'd like to use the simple example of a London taxi cab to illustrate this example, why we don't believe in this. Um, and I'm not too sure if you are aware that in order for you to get your London taxi cab license, you have to memorize 25,000 street names. And what makes it worse, during your test to get your license, they give you uh, random locations within London, and you need to uh, recommend the quickest route to get from point A to point B 
from those 25,000 streets. And you have to do all of that by memory. Whereas if you take a look at it when you can apply technology, and the Uber example applies again, by simply using your smartphone, you're able to empower a person with just a driver's license to not only navigate the, the busy streets of London, but also understand where traffic is and actually provide an even better solution than the, the London taxi cab. And the point of the slide is that if applied correctly, the fourth industrial revolution technologies has the opportunity and the ability to actually empower semi-skilled people to do much more complicated tasks, as in the example of an Uber driver. Just by, by, by having a smartphone and a driver's license, you can actually become a taxi driver. And for us, this is an important concept. We want all of our solutions that we develop at GenderMark to be able to empower semi-skilled people to do more complicated jobs. This is the only opportunity we believe to actually bring more and more people uh, and more and more underprivileged people into the economy and start contributing to society. The next myth that I'd like to talk about is this idea that the fourth industrial revolution can only be applied once you finish the third industrial revolution. And we think that this is not true at all. What we believe is that each of the industrial revolutions offered a different type of technology that solved different types of problems. And what's more important for us is to really understand what a customer problem is and apply the right solution to that particular problem. And it may not necessarily require automation. It might be straight digitalization, or it might require a combination of the two. Um, so this idea that from an, uh, a developing country perspective, we have to first do the third industrial revolution before we can use the fourth industrial revolution, we don't agree with at all. And if you, if you just take the African content, continent as an example, we actually skip the landline. Those of you that understood and are a little bit older would know that in your house, you had a cable running to your house so that you could phone somebody. On the African continent, we actually skipped that completely and went straight to the smartphone. And that's an example of where we can skip previous versions of technology to the latest version because it's much more effective and cost effective. Um, and so what we believe is, as I said earlier, is that applying the right technology to the right solution is far more important than following a, a series um, of events. The next myth is one that I hear a lot about and that it's the AI is going to take over, technology is going to harm us. And again, I'd like to remind everyone that technology has never been deterministic. Uh, and to illustrate this, I think there's no better technology to, to explain this uh, in, in a better way than nuclear power. And this is an example of a technology that was used for bad and it was used for good. And the point here is that us as humans, we have the ability to apply the technology and determine the outcome. So we can apply it for, for bad or we can apply it for good. The technology has never been deterministic on its own. We as humans will always be the driver of the outcome of the technology. And I think that's a very important point, which is why ethics in, in, in the new world becomes even more important. How we use the technology in an ethical way to actually improve our society is far more important than the technology itself. And so we determine the impact. We determine the outcome as humans. The technology never decided. And I, and I, I just want to kind of end off this point with a very simple example that I, I used to explain to uh, my 75-year-old dad the other day. And it's a simple example of imagine the fourth industrial revolution technologies in a toolkit or a toolbox. And the, you can imagine a toolbox with a hammer inside and assume that the hammer is one of the fourth industrial revolution technologies. I can take that hammer and bang somebody's hand with it and actually break their hand. Or I can take the same hammer and I can actually help that person build a house. And the point is that we have the ability and the power to determine the outcome of the technology. So the hammer is just an illustration of AI or VR or facial recognition or wh whatever the technology might be, we as humans determine the outcome. So I can, as I say, I can use the hammer for good or I can use the hammer for bad. Um, and that's a very important point. The AI is not going to take over unless we let it. The AI can do a lot of good and, and create a huge amount of opportunities for us if we decide it. The next myth I'd like to talk about is this idea that the fourth industrial revolution has no space for the developing world or in the developing world. And to better explain this, I just want to use these population pyramids to explain the point here. And what you can see over here is a population pyramid of Western Europe. 
And just to give you an idea of what it's illustrating here is that at the bottom here is the size of the population from ages zero to five, all the way up to approximately 100 years old. And on the one side is male and on the other side is female. And what you can clearly see here is that populations are getting smaller and smaller. So there's much less people, uh, much less younger people that will eventually move into the working world versus the current working world, which is approximately, call it 25 to 65. And what that means is that the future, um, there will be less and less future um, uh, people uh, that can work in factories or banks or in industry as a whole. And when you have less people coming into the working world, that means supply is less and Economics 101 tells us demand goes up and when demand goes up, the cost goes up, which is why you see huge labor costs in the, developing, in the developed world. It's purely because the populations are getting smaller and smaller. It's a, it's a pretty simple concept to understand. And so one of the biggest drivers of the fourth industrial revolution is to make developed countries uh, more competitive because if they don't become competitive, they lose out to business to developing countries where labor rates are much lower. And so what the idea behind the fourth industrial revolution from a developed world perspective is to use technology to do more with less people. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you have to try and automate a lot of these processes because there's just not enough people to do the work that needs to get done. And in complete contrast, as you can see over here, the African population pyramid is literally a population pyramid and a uh, huge youth bulge that's on its way. Um, uh, this, this population is approximately, approximately 1.3 billion people. This population pyramid is approximately 260 million people. So even the scale is not quite correct on my slide over here. Um, and this is projected to become 2.2 billion people in the next 10 years. And the scary number that really saddens me is the fact that in South Africa alone, 75% of our youth is actually unemployed. Our, our national unemployment number is around 35 to 40%, but 75% of our youth is actually unemployed. And so what we believe is that if we apply this set of technology to solve this problem on this population, we'll have a huge social crisis. And so what we believe is that we have to change the paradigm on what we do with this technology. And we have to use technology to do more with more people. And to do that, we have to understand the difference between automation, which is what's required in this society and this population, versus what we believe is the real opportunity and the solution for this population is digitalization. And what we firmly believe is that the space for the fourth industrial revolution is far greater in the develop, developing world than what it is in the developed world simply because we have populations that we're able to network and connect and do things in a much more efficient way because we have the manpower, we have the labor, we have the human capital that these populations don't have. Having spoken about the different challenges uh, around the different types of population pyramids, that doesn't mean from a developing country perspective we can't learn from what's been already adopted in the developed world. And to explain uh, what I mean by this, I just want to compare two uh, hotel companies. I think everyone's pretty familiar with Hilton um, and everyone's pretty familiar with Airbnb. And I want to just do a comparison between these two organizations um, uh, as, a, a, as an intro to how we can learn from this comparison uh, from a developing country perspective. So the first comparison is the cost to open up a new room. It costs Hilton approximately $210,000, and as everybody knows, it costs Airbnb zero. The number of new rooms that are opened per year, approximately 24,000 people, uh, rooms opened per year in Hilton, and approximately 365,000 rooms opened per year uh, on, on the Airbnb platform. Hilton have approximately 775,000 rooms available on their platform, um, and Airbnb have now over 2 million rooms available on their platform. And as you can see from, from the slide, there's, there's a, a, a huge growth that's happened uh, for Airbnb, whereas it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more challenging for Hilton. And one really important point that I want to illustrate, Hilton is over 100 years old, started in 1919. Airbnb is not even 15 years old yet, and they're already a $38 billion organization and already taking it to Hilton. And the way we describe this is that it's actually a new game that Airbnb are playing. And the simple analogy I give people is that imagine you're playing football and your, your, your opponent is actually playing football against you 
we have referees that guide us and, and control us so that we play against uh, each other according to a common set of rules. And that's exactly what's happened over here. Hilton have been playing, uh, uh, by, have been following the rules and playing against the Sheraton and Marriott, etc., etc. And along came Airbnb, and while they were playing by the same set of rules, what happened is Airbnb came and picked up the ball with their hands and ran with it. So they've completely changed the rules of the game. While Hilton was competing against Marriott, Airbnb came along and, and changed the rules and is playing a completely new game. Having said that, um, it's not like Hilton or any of these hotel chains have not been adopting technology. In fact, it's the complete opposite. They all have online booking platforms. They all have integrated payment systems. They all have big data analysis, which drives their surge pricing. And even more recently, I had an experience at, at a Marriott hotel in the US where I did a complete online check-in using my mobile phone. I arrived at the hotel. Um, I showed them my, my identity document. And I actually then walked straight to my room because my room number was available on my phone. And I actually opened my room door using my phone. So it's not like these hotel chains or Hilton in this particular example haven't been adopting technology. It's really about understanding where you adopt this technology and how you adopt the technology. And if you look at Hilton and many other organizations, including some of our, our manufacturing customers and including Gendermark ourselves, what we are doing is we're taking our existing operations, applying technologies to improve our operations at an operational level. And what we believe is that this is just an evolution. So we're improving our, 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 our business operations by using technology, which is not a bad thing. But what, what we see is that Airbnb have changed the game from a business model perspective. They've used the new technologies that are available and created new business models. And so what you see is that Airbnb have created new business models, which is what we believe is the actual revolution, which is why we believe it's the fourth industrial revolution. It's about understanding the business models that are, that are available to us and how do we use those new business models that are supported by the different technologies to change the game um, as Airbnb have changed the game in the hotel world. And so taking it one step further, it's really important for us as organizations that have been built in the third industrial revolution, like some of these companies, and I put my own company in this bracket as well, and we really try to understand how do we transform our businesses from third industrial revolution business models into fourth industrial revolution business models. And fortunately for us, we have some examples. Airbnb is, another, is an example we've spoken about already. Netflix, Tesla, Uber, a very good South African example is Take A Lot. These are all platform businesses. These are all network businesses. And so the question that we've got from a gender mark automation perspective is how do we transform our business from a third industrial revolution into a fourth industrial revolution business? And that might mean disrupting everything we've done for the last 25 years and realizing that that may have been the old way of doing things and we need to stop doing that and actually change the way we do our business, which might mean, as I say, disrupting our, our own business, which is a scary place to be. Um, and something that we grapple with uh, on a daily basis. But it's an important uh, uh, idea and it's an important step we have to take because if we don't take it, we're waiting for our Airbnb and come and play a new game in our space. And a lot of these concepts that, that, that I'm speaking about are not our own concepts. We actually um, have learned about these from various uh, uh, research that we've done. And one important um, reference that I, I feel obligated to make is referring to this idea of gaffonomics. And you can Google gaffonomics uh, to understand more about this new game, this, these new business models that have been established that are, that, are, that are really revolutionizing and changing the game, so to speak. And uh, what gaffonomics stands for is Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon economics. Um, as I say, I think it's important that I make reference to them because a lot of what I've learned over the last five to six years actually, actually comes from uh, this idea of gaffonomics. So, Zoning in closer to what we need to do as a, an African organization, as an organization that comes from a developing world environment, uh, is to really understand this idea of a network business. And again, what, what I want to do is I want to learn from a very good example, which is Uber. And as you can see over here, this is a sort of 
network structure of how Uber is put together. They basically uh, have, uh, ex using existing technologies like Google Maps, the Play Store, cloud computing, the different payment systems, all networked together. They use different services uh, to support their rating system. Uh, and basically what Uber have done is they've been able to network all of these existing technologies together to, to develop their own uh, solution called Uber. And the idea here and the point of this particular slide is to illustrate that Uber didn't have to reinvent the wheel with Google Maps. They didn't have to create the App Store. They didn't have to create the concept of cloud computing, nor the payment systems, or this idea of dynamic pricing or the rating system. These were existing solutions and technologies that were available, and what they did was they networked them all together to, to create a, a solution to solve a particular problem. And so what we need to understand from a, a, a developing country perspective is we need to become network orchestrators. We need to understand the solutions that are available, be able to be, get, creative in how, get creative in how we network these solutions together to solve our particular challenges. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to reinvent cloud computing. We don't need to reinvent Google Maps or the payment systems or the rating systems. What we need to do is get creative, understand what solutions are available, understand our problems intimately, and get creative in how we, we, we network, orchestrate these solutions together to solve our particular challenges. So having looked at Uber from a technology perspective, I want to move to the business model that Uber operates. And that is what we would simply, simply call a two-sided marketplace. And it's a very simple concept. Basically, Uber is a platform in the middle, and they are facilitating a transaction between a set of drivers on one side of the market and a set of riders on the other, on the other side of the market. And this is a very interesting concept in that all Uber does is, is facilitate a transaction between two people. And what's interesting about two-sided marketplaces is that the more drivers come onto the platform in a particular location, the more effective and efficient the Uber solution is to the particular to potential riders. And the more uh, the more efficient the system becomes, the less time you wait for a pickup. The more riders want to use the system, and the more riders that want to use the system, uh, it means that more drivers are required, and so more drivers come onto the system because they can make more money. So both sides of the network are critical. And when one side grows, the other side grows. And when the other side grows, the opposite side also grows. And that's a very important point about a two-sided marketplace. And all Uber does is, is manage the transaction, they manage the brand, they manage the quality of the system, um, and they take a small cut of, the obviously, obviously the transaction fee. And another example of a, of a two-sided marketplace that I think we're all familiar with is the iPhone. So you can imagine the iPhone in the center of this marketplace, and on the one side of the iPhone, the iPhone users and the, and the iPhone fanboys like, like, like me on the one side of the marketplace and on the opposite side of the marketplace are all the app developers. And you can understand that the more apps that are developed for the iPhone on, on the app store, the more customization can happen on an iPhone, the, the better the iPhone user experience is, the more options I have as an iPhone user, the more people want to buy iPhones. And the more people that want to buy iPhones, the more opportunities there are for apps developers to create apps that iPhone users would buy. And Apple is the platform in the middle. And this is an interesting concept that we want to adopt from a gender mark perspective. And how we want to do this is we want to be able to build a manufacturing platform that's also a two-sided marketplace that services both sides of the market. The one obvious side is our manufacturing customers. These can be big and small customers that want to use our digital solutions uh, to solve their particular production challenges. And on the other side of the marketplace, and which is where the opportunity lies, is small to medium-sized engineering firms that want to be able to offer complex solutions to manufacturing companies but don't have the experience um, or the solutions available. What we want to do is we want to offer them our own manufacturing platform to be able to uh, deploy in these factories by these uh, engineering service companies or small to medium enterprises. And so what we try to achieve with this is obviously a, a two-sided marketplace for a gender, from a gender mark perspective, but also create opportunities for small to medium organizations that don't necessarily have the skills and the ability to deploy a preventative maintenance solution or to, to deploy a traceability solution or an operator guidance solution. But using our platform and our tools, 
they are able to deliver these complex and critical processes and solutions to manufacturing companies, big and small. So diving into Odin Manufacturing. It consists of a number of products that have been carefully crafted and designed to solve a number of manufacturing challenges. And I unfortunately don't have enough time to go through each of these products one by one, but I just want to highlight one or two of them just to illustrate the ideas and the concepts around uh, how we can use technology to actually empower the human on the production line. The first example that I want to talk about is our Odin workstation and in particular our operator guidance system. What you see over here is a guidance system that's been developed and the analogy that I tell people is that you can imagine it as the Google Maps for the operator. On the one side you see the, the directions that they need to follow, so the step-by-step -step guide. That's been um, complemented by a set of uh, pictures and animated pictures that guide the operator step-by-step. Um, and as they perform the different tasks, we have systems to, to manage and secure that those tasks have actually been done correctly using advanced tightening technologies, using AI cameras, which I'll show you a little bit about now, barcode scanning, uh, and intuitive interfaces that tell them when they make a mistake. And even more importantly, what we've also been able to do is when uh, a, an operator or a, a, a line worker makes a mistake, we actually, like Google Maps, guide the operator on where to make a U-turn and actually come back so that they are following the right process again. So it's a really smart, intuitive system that adapts to the operator's processes step by step and even when they make a mistake, we're able to redirect them back to follow the right process. Um, and this is, a, this, is, this is the real opportunity and the fundamental principle behind all of our products. We are really trying to use technology to, to enable semi-skilled people to assemble and do more, more complicated tasks on a production line. And this is an example of a very complicated engine that's being assembled by semi-skilled people um, at one of our factories in, in India. And one of the other use cases of technology uh, to really empower a, an operator on a production line is the use of AI and machine learning using uh, camera systems. What this little video clip is illustrating is our ability to create a, 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 an AI model of this bolting tool. We can now, as a result of that, we can now determine the position of the bolting tool and even where the tip of the bolting tool is so that we can actually control the sequence of events that happen using that bolting tool. So what's really critical in this process is the sequence in which the operator tightens these bolts. And if the operator makes a mistake and goes to the wrong position, we can actually disable the tool, indicate to the operator on the operator guidance system to say that you're in the wrong position, please move to the right position. And so these are, this is a use of technology to really guide the operator to prevent them from making a mistake. Um, we've also created a number of other solutions that uh, empower operators to make sure that they pick the right component, as you can see over here. We've also created a virtual button down here. You see the red, the, the red square. What that does is also allows us to reduce the cost of the station. So we now no longer need to buy expensive buttons and install them on the station. We can actually start to create these virtual buttons. And in the future, we'll be making more and more of these virtual devices that at the end of the day, reduce the overall cost of the station significantly because we are really taking advantage of AI and vision control systems um, to guide the operator and, and, and it did, in addition to guiding operators, we're actually reducing the cost of the station. One real use case that we're working on where we could potentially apply this technology uh, is in this, in this idea of network manufacturing or distributed manufacturing. And to illustrate that is this, I want to use an example of this gentleman called Tepiso. He was unfortunately uh, retrenched from a washing powder factory where he worked. And while he worked there, he actually learned the skill um, to actually manufacture washing powder. And so what you see in this picture is him actually manufacturing washing powder at a, at a low scale uh, in his backyard or in his back uh, garage. And what we thought was maybe this is a real opportunity to take Tepiso and his sort of, uh, we call it in South Africa, township manufacturing example and actually digit, digitize that. And so what we've done is we've concepted a machine that runs Odin Workstation, that has the AI cameras that actually uh, is able to control the volume and the sequence in which Tepiso 
puts the, the chemicals together according to a particular formulation. Um, and what we want to do is we want to be able to build a network business around Cepiso's assembly cell. So let's call it the Uberization of washing powder. And on you know, discussion with Cepiso, we asked him, what are your biggest challenges? And the biggest challenge, he said, is that his, his, his formulation that he's come up with is not actually approved by any certification bodies. So actually, technically, he's not allowed to be manufacturing washing powder. So what we thought was, if we could connect him and digitize his business, what we could do is we could create an expert interface. And so what this expert interface could theoretically be is an interface where somebody that has the skills and has the, the approval, uh, that understands the approval process for washing powder formulation can actually enter in the formulation of the washing powder. That person doesn't have to be close to where Tsepiso is. It can be in South Africa, it could be in Germany, it could be in India, it could be in the US, doesn't matter because it's all connected. So what we could now do is we could bring experts from around the world to create formulations for Tsepiso's washing powder process. Once those formulations have been downloaded onto Tsepiso's um, manufacturing cell, the AI and the control systems we've developed as I illustrated earlier, actually control the sequence and make sure Tsepiso follows the right process in manufacturing the washing powder. What we can then do is obviously build a, a cloud application, we can build an app for Tsepiso, we can use location services so that his customers know where Tsepiso is, and we can actually build a digital business around Tsepiso. We can even take it one step further where we could have delivery services using Uber and basically connecting two different ecosystems together so that his washing powder could be delivered using Uber to his customers from any location, or to any location. And so this is a very, very, I guess, hypothetical and theoretical example that a lot of people may think is really um, low-grade manufacturing or not high-tech manufacturing. But let's take a, take a deeper look and understand if this is actually advanced manufacturing. So one of the key drivers of the fourth industrial revolution is this idea of mass customization or individualization of everything. Like the iPhone example I gave earlier is that one of the fundamental uh, principles that the iPhone I has is that every iPhone is different once you get it because we are all able to customize our, our iPhones to our own personal preferences. So one thing that we might be able to achieve with Cepiso on a digital washing powder manufacturing platform is Say, for example, I work in a, in a service garage where I'm you know, servicing engines and I always get full of grease. Um, and so what I would typically need is an extra strong washing powder. And if my favorite fragrance is cinnamon, what I theoretically could do is go onto Tsepiso's washing powder app, order extra strong washing powder with the cinnamon scent. And because he's making a low volume or what we would term batch size one, Tsepiso would be able to make my customized extra strong cinnamon scented washing powder. And today, the most advanced manu uh, washing powder factories are not able to customize washing powder. So Tsepiso has actually ticked the box that most advanced manufacturing uh, organizations cannot do. He can customize washing powder to me. And it's not low quality at all because the processes have been put in place to secure the quality systems. The other, the other important part of advanced manufacturing, which is really important to us, is, is our obviously environmental impact. And one of the biggest challenges with washing powder and most uh, fast-moving consumer goods is packaging and the recycling of the packaging. And as you can see over here, Tsepiso has these white buckets, and some of them are even bigger green or yellow buckets. He has a simple solution. So his customers arrive with an empty bucket. They give him the empty bucket, he, and he gives them a, a full bucket of washing powder, depending on the size that they've ordered. So he's actually recycling the containers, um, which most advanced manufacturing washing powder factories cannot do. Today, when you buy a packet of washing powder from the most expensive retail stores out there, the 99% of the time, the packet that the washing powder is in is not even recyclable. Yet Seppo, in his township manufacturing facility, he can recycle packaging that a lot, a lot of advanced manufacturing organizations cannot. It is obviously centered around empowering individuals. So what we've been able to do is obviously uh, create a, a, a digital business around Cepiso. We can obviously uh, create opportunities for him to find new customers. We can help him with his, uh, um, or we can digitize his, uh, his logistics, his inbound and outbound logistics because it's all digitally controlled. 
And more importantly, what we can now do is we can scale the concept to multiple people. And in South Africa, we call it townships. We can now scale Tepiso's washing powder concept to every single township in South Africa. And we can now start creating opportunities for this township economy. We can actually digitize the township economy and not just for service related topics, for actual manufacturing. So this is our idea and our concept of distributed manufacturing, where we can really replicate Tepiso's manufacturing to multiple locations, to multiple townships, to create opportunities for disadvantaged people uh, in our communities. And for us, this is one of the most important points, which is why we keep talking about making the fourth industrial revolution more human. It's really about understanding what the technologies are, understanding the opportunities that lie, uh, that are available with these technologies and applying them to solve our challenges. And, and I want to remind you about the population pyramid of, of Africa and the fact that most developing countries have a similar population pyramid. It is our responsibility and it's important for us to take a leadership step in driving this use of technology to solve our challenges. And our challenges, specifically in South Africa, is 75% youth unemployment. So we have to tackle that problem. And the only ways we do that is to make the fourth industrial revolution more human. So the reason why we, why we do this presentation is to make people aware of what we believe the opportunities are in the fourth industrial revolution. We are really open to, to everyone's opinion, both for and probably more importantly against our ideas and thoughts. Um, and we would, we would love to engage further. If you are interested, scan the QR code. Uh, for more information about myself and, and our, our, our products we're building and about gender mark automation. Um, thank you very much.